Jack the Ripper was and is to this day the world's most famous serial killer. This is particularly strange because he's believed to have only had five victims, which is not a lot compared to other serial killers. So what made Jack the Ripper so famous? Part of his appeal was that the police never found him. Forensics were still in their very early days in 1888. Thanks to some modern methods, we do have some idea as to who he was. So then. Who was Jack the Ripper? Jack the Ripper terrorized East London for 12 weeks in 1888 and targeted prostitutes living and working in one of London's poorest crime districts, Whitechapel. Jack the Ripper was also known as the Whitechapel Murderer. His five known victims were Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly. The victims sometimes had their throats slashed and internal organs removed. It is unclear if the five known victims are the Ripper's only victims. Whitechapel was a densely populated area, but most of the killings happened within a few streets of each other as well as on weekends and public holidays. The Ripper either could have been a local who worked regularly, or he was an educated, upper class man, possibly a doctor, who targeted victims in a lower class neighborhood. The Ripper was suspected of being a doctor because the mutilation of his victims appeared to suggest he was surgically trained. Hundreds of letters were sent to law enforcement and the media over the course of the murders, some claiming to be from the Ripper, others offering advice on how to catch him. Many of these letters were believed to have been sent by journalists, posing as the Ripper. Even though the police never figured out exactly who he was, there were definitely suspects. Suspects. Aaron Kosminski, Thomas Cutbush, and Montague John Druitt were the main ones. According to new DNA evidence, the bloodstained shawl of Catherine Eddowes, one of the Ripper's victims, contained 126 year old DNA that doctors compared to the DNA from descendants of Catherine Eddowes. The DNA matched to Aaron Kosminski. Kosminski was a Polish Jewish immigrant. He fled to London from Poland, which was being controlled by Russia at the time. He lived with his two brothers and sisters on Greenfield Street, which is where Elizabeth Stride was killed. Kosminski was said to be suffering from serious mental illness. And and spent much of his life in and out of asylums. He died in one of these institutions from gangrene. So the official story is, Kaminsky was Jack the Ripper. But according to Richard Cobb, who runs the Jack the Ripper conventions, the shawl belonged to Catherine Eddowes has been handled by many people. Not to mention, like many men living in East London, Kaminsky probably frequented prostitutes, including Catherine Eddowes. But there is another very compelling theory that makes the claim that Jack the Ripper was actually an American doctor, who goes by the name of Dr. H. H. Holmes. Holmes was America's first serial killer, who terrorized Chicago in the late 1880s. He built elaborate death traps in a massive three-story hotel, known as Murder Castle. Holmes confessed to killing 27 people, but he may have killed closer to 200. Hello people, welcome to my YouTube channel once again. My name is Tolisha Do Francis, aka The Mentalist. If this is your first time on this channel, please, please and please subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Now what this bell does for you is that each time there's a new video, you get notified that there's a new video and you're able to watch. And if you're a returning subscriber and and you know that the things you'll be seeing on my channel will be worth the while for anybody. Please go ahead to share my videos and also turn on the notification bell so that when a new video comes up, you also will be aware. All right, so let's get down to business. Now, this particular episode or this particular video, I will be talking about something called the copycat effect in children. Now, what the copycat effect really means, as the word implies, copy and cat. I'm sure many of us who attended high school, secondary school, and the likes, you hear things like, Copy, copy, you know, copycat. Especially if you school in a country like mine, Nigeria, where if you want to yap someone that is copying you, you say, ah, copy, copy, or copycat. So it's just what it is, copycat, right? So copy something that you are seeing or something that has been done and you want to do it. So it's a global phenomenon. It's something that exists, right? Where um, children or whatever is seen in the mass media is being practiced and being, so we say it's being repeated. And unfortunately, the person who is copying the previous act does it way more than the initial uh, performer of the act, right? So, and this happens especially when um, things like um, suicide attempts have been told to us or um, gun violence and a couple of things. But it happens anywhere, in any setting, at any point in time where people just want to copy what they see. So let's get out to business. Let's check exactly what's the history of this copycat effect uh, phenomenon. I mean, who originated it and how has it passed on from year to year. Come with me as we look at this together. So the copycat effect actually originated from a particular um, a particular guy called Jack the Ripper. Now, it's the alleged tendency of sensational publicity about violent murders or suicide to result in more of the same through imitation. The term was first coined in 1916 due to the crimes that were inspired by Jack the Ripper. Now, although initially it was used for crime and murder cases, but has gone ahead to move away from those crime and murder cases to anything that has the tendency of being copied, right? So it's also referred to as the contagion effect, imitation, 
mimesis or clusters and refers to the power of mass communication right so which is why usually we warn against you coming out to tell people on social media how someone attempted suicide what the person did because what you're trying to do is that you're passing across that information to anybody who has been contemplating suicide before now and so the person gets an idea of okay so this what this work has not been working for me so if i do this it will work okay so maybe i should try this one so it becomes very very contagious and then people go ahead to do it now my focus today is on how adults the things that adults do and how it goes on to affect children or how children tend to copy those things from us now children are better learners even in case you don't know um the fact that they don't practice what you do in your presence doesn't mean that they haven't learned from you they are fast learners and they are quiet learners and they don't give up i mean if you ever had any kid around you you would, would have seen some of them where you leave something behind and then you come back and then they try to open that stuff and see what's there or dismantle to see what's there they are very very inquisitive and so you can't afford to do just anything in their presence you have to be very, very careful whatever you're doing in their presence they explore more than adults and because they explore this makes them learn better than grown-ups a lot of times adults are quick to go like i'm tired i'm not doing it anymore but a child will continue until he or she sees the result of that particular thing so they get satisfaction in exploring you see the process of putting those things together or dismantling those things gives them excitement they are not interested in the reward that they would get when they are doing all of those things their concern is what is in this particular thing I want to see it. Why does mommy apply this lipstick? Let me put it. Let me see what I will look like. You know, why do they? Why do you dress this way? Let me try it as well. Why are you in the kitchen? Why can't I enter the kitchen? You know, so they are very, very inquisitive. Even if they cannot talk, and it starts from from the moment they're able to crawl around, you begin to see them uh, put up some of those some of those behaviors. They have an intense curiosity and drive to explore, and this makes them learn different things and so quickly. Now. Of course, this is not different from the copycat effect, right? Now, let me share something with you about an experiment that was done some years back. So, two computing neuroscientists picked some 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 young people, um, very young, between age four and five, and about another adult. All right, so they put all of them together in a part. <coughs> Excuse me. So they put all of them together in a particular um, in a particular room, about eighty-seven adults and about sixty-four young children. Now they gave them a go a game to play, right? And what was the game? They gave them different blocks, you know, and there was one rule. If the machine lights up, you get a prize because it's not a star. If the machine doesn't light up, then you lose twice as much. Now, guess what? The goal of the game was to discover that all the blocks work except for the ones with white spots. In other words, if you got the ones with black spots, you are fine. But if you got the ones with white spot, they're nothing for you, right? Now, most of the children were able to figure out the rule correctly, whereas more than 70% of the adults couldn't. Now, remember that if you got it wrong, you lose twice as much stars as you should have gotten if you won. Now, the children were not interested in the stars. They were interested in figuring out the solution to that particular problem. And guess what happened? The children earned fewer, fewer stars. And that's to tell you that children are willing to sacrifice the stars just for them to get the result. Now this tells you that while you are running up and down here and there as an adult trying to get a particular result to something, children are interested in knowing the process, trying to understand why do you do the things that you do or why are you doing these things that you're doing. So for every material that you expose your children to or that you expose any child around you to, the chances are that they will go back to practice it. And you will not be there when they will practice this thing. That's just the truth, right? And they will practice it much more than you will. Let me give you a, a, a funny gist. So growing up as a child in another part of Nigeria, so to precisely, I used to have this female friend. Um, I don't know where she is now, in the part of the world. Her name is Maye. So we used to do daddy and mommy. So anytime my parents left the house, she would come over to my place and then we'd do mommy and daddy. We'd sleep on the same bed, try to do as if we were cooking and stuff like that. And as I grew older, one day I sat and I began to think of this daddy and mommy thing. And I realized that we both were trying to replicate the things that we had seen our parents do, except for sex, of course, we didn't have sex, right? But, you know, sleeping on the same bed, cuddling each other, at that age, I was less than... I'm very sure I, was, I wasn't a teenager yet, I'm very, very sure, yeah, because I was in primary school, right? So, I realized that time she came around, um, you know, we'd be in the room together, oh yeah, come and sleep, I'm the daddy, you are the mom, you are this, our child. You know, my younger sister, then I bet she can't remember. I'm five years older than she is. I bet she can't remember. Will be our child. 
then you know like oh yeah you are a child yeah you sleep like this that their mommy wants to sleep yeah this is that their mommy's room and then arrange all those things and stuff like that now this is a typical example of what we have seen our parents do at different times and we're trying to copy what about the games of police and thief that people play in secondary school who gave the idea that there is a game called police and thief that the police has to always chase the thief it's the things that we have seen on tv or in movies that give us the idea that there's always a police and there's always a thief. And just 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 to bring a funny part for some of us who may remember, um, actor and bows, right? We pick paper and they will draw this, the actor, this, the bows. Because when we watch movies, I mean, in the days of Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, Sylvester Stallone, and the likes, the huge guy is always the actor because he's one who can never die. And then the bows is that you know is that other young. I don't know where that name bows came from, but my my point is. We are we children are quick to pick up things and they practice it while you are not there. The songs that you dance to, um, the way you do your makeup, the way you dress and stuff like that. They are always looking, and then one day you just realize that this child is doing this way. Even the way you speak, right? If I, let's not even go far to children. If you listen to some um, some people speak, you real you would, nobody would tell you to know that they have actually been listening to a particular person, and so they are trying to speak like that person or act like that person. So it's very very easy. When I return, I'll share with you um, um, some points to take note of as you engage children, right? So that you begin to pay attention to, or you begin to understand how children think and the kind of things that children do. So you don't make mistakes when you are with them and you can pay better attention to them. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back.